Samuel Chu is a badass community organizer and Hong Konger fighting for democracy. He's American and originally from Hong Kong, and he founded the Hong Kong Democracy Council, which fought for Hong Kong's pro-democracy movement in the United States. He's worked to pass some critical legislation and has fought for a number of policies to support Hong Kong, and as a result, authorities there have issued an arrest warrant for him. In fact, he's wanted by the Hong Kong police for allegedly inciting secession and collusion with foreign governments to endanger Chinese security. Samuel is also the son of the Reverend Chu Yu Ming, who occupies Central that led to the Umbrella Movement in Hong Kong in 2014. Two years ago, his father was tried, convicted, and sentenced on protest-related charges. Samuel has a long list of achievements as a community organizer in issues beyond democracy in Hong Kong. And in our interview, he explains why that prepared him for his most important fight. Hi, geeks. I am here again in Miami at the Also Freedom Forum with my new geeky friend, Samuel Chu, who is a Hong Konger democracy activist. He has a lot of accomplishments under his belt, very intimidating, very exciting to meet you. Why don't you start off by telling us your story of how you became an activist, in particular fighting for democracy in Hong Kong? Well, so working backwards, you know, when I woke up a year ago, a little over a year ago, as a wanted fugitive under the national security law in Hong Kong, I think that there are a lot of people who asked me, was like, how, how did that feel? But really, for me, as you said, I have actually been doing this work in various contexts for a long time. And I think the most succinct way I can probably describe my career is that I just like to get shit done. <laughs> and I think that a lot of time activism has now become more about talking about things, you have opinion about that, posting about that. And so it doesn't matter really to me. I have fought for uh, pro-democracy and human rights in Hong Kong. I've done LGBT equality rights. I have done immigrant rights. I've done work on like low-income anti-poverty work. For me, it's about getting the ability, giving people the power to get shit done for what they most care about themselves. And so I think this applies in the Hong Kong context, it applies in the greater anti-authoritarian context. So that's what I have really spent my life doing. I love it. And and how personally, like share a little bit about your personal story. Um, you know, what it's like to fight for activism, how you, you've obviously been raised in this world. Tell everybody a little bit about that story. Yeah. So I, you know, it's in some way, this is in the DNA. I sort of, in, in some way, I, I some people, my friends make fun of me that I was, if this is inevitable, this is sort of destiny. Uh, there's a little bit of like the Harry Potter, uh, you know, like uh, the thing. So my father back in 20, uh, 1989 was one of the supporter that helped uh, supported the Tiananmen Square student protests uh, in Beijing. And when the massacre happened, when the CCP came in and rode the tanks and fired the machine guns, my father actually helped rescue through an underground railroad that he helped build the dissident who escaped the massacre. And then they hid them in safe houses in Hong Kong. And this is actually the interesting part of the story is that like I had a front row seat. I actually spent evenings and weekends playing soccer and playing cards with these dissidents who were hiding, who had just escaped machine guns and, and tanks. And so it really ingrained in me, I think, this idea of not just that this is a, a, a movement of all of us, that this is our future at stake, but also that we should be doing whatever we can to risk whatever we can to be helpful and to be supportive. And so I actually was sent away to come to the U.S. when I was a teenager at 12. My father thought that there might be some retaliation. So I came here and I spent most of my career in the U.S. working on social justice here. But really, I think for me, when the movement continued in Hong Kong in 2014 and in 2019, what I really saw was that, yes, the protest was getting attention, but it wasn't getting the real changes that was necessary in U.S. politics and global politics. And that I just look back and realize that I have spent my last 20 years preparing for exactly this moment. All the relationship I've built, all the experience I had fighting for equality and social justice now can be applied to be the international front line for the movement in Hong Kong. And that really, I think, you know, when I look back, you know, obviously none of us knew in 1990 when I arrived in the U.S. that I would end up leading the U.S. campaign for Hong Kong. But 
that's kind of what exactly happened. And in a way, it's ironic for the CCP because they essentially forced my father to send me to the U.S. and I turned out to be a thorn in their side 30 years later. I love that. That is so true. And that is such a good way to put it, right? And it's one of those, it's one of the arguments I always make is that these dictators and thugs think that by silencing people or imprisoning people or m forcing them to go into exile, that that's somehow going to help them maintain power. And it actually always backfires. They never really seem to notice that, though. So you've had a lot of success in general in this campaign and in Washington in particular. You really work to pass a lot of great legislation. Can you tell us what are the signs of hope that you're seeing in general and what more can the United States do, the international community do, uh, those watching? What can we do to help support democracy and human rights in Hong Kong? Like you said, I think we've actually have made a lot of progress as far as actually passing and, and, and drafting individual legislation. But I think the more important thing is that nowadays, today, if you talk about Hong Kong, everyone identifies Hong Kong as the center of this uh, protest movement. It is in the identity. It's defining what Hong Kong means. And people have now come to see Hong Kong as the pivotal front line between sort of CCP authoritarian regime and the world, you know, of the democracies on the other side. That, I think, is probably the most important shift that has happened. And I think that beyond any single legislation, you know, when we pass the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act, when we pass a legislation to ban, you know, crowd controls, uh, you know, tools and, and materials to Hong Kong police, when we're passing these laws and imposing these sanctions, ultimately what we're doing is clarifying that we can't let authoritarian regime not only repress its own people, but export its authoritarianism to everywhere in the world. And it's doing it, they're doing it and happening right under our watch. And that there's a fallacy and a magical thinking in the US and other countries that somehow we trade more and do more business, that the world's gonna be freer and, and better. That doesn't work. And I think that that is really the landscape shift that I think we have been able to accomplish. That's not necessarily immediately going to resolve what's happening in Hong Kong. I think that we we now have all come to accept that our city that I grew up in, that I was born in, that I love, has fallen. Uh, but I think what we are doing is to say and recognize that uh, this represents a fate not only for the 7.5 million Hong Kongers. It represents the fate of a global community. That if we don't fight and stand our line and and preserve what is there for Hong Kongers and then restore it when the moment comes, then it's going to come to our front door before we know it. That's so well put. Thank you. I appreciate that. You heard him. We know what to do. So long. Road ahead. But either way, Samuel, I'm so grateful to have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining me. And thank you so much, more importantly, for your work. Thank you so much. Samuel's awesome, and he has as much energy as I do, which is hard to find. I want to say a huge thanks to him and to the Human Rights Foundation and also Freedom Forum for making this interview possible. If you like this interview, be sure to check out our other videos with amazing activists and dissidents, and don't forget to subscribe, like this video, and leave us a comment below.